the Hillsborough Ripple Effect. Message from Moadib about the Hillsborough disaster. We hope this finds you well, in good spirit, and having a good day. Using Occam's razor and common sense, let's look at the known facts about Hillsborough and the lies we have been told and see what most likely really did happen that day. Chapter 1. Maggie Thatcher Prime Minister Maggie Thatcher hated Liverpoolians because of the Toxteth riots in 1981 and the Liverpool supporters because of the Heysel disaster in 1985 and the subsequent disgrace and banning of English clubs from European football. So did Bernard Ingham, her press secretary who immediately accused the Liverpool fans of causing the Hillsborough disaster. Proof that Ingham hated the Liverpool supporters is given by the residents of Hebden Bridge. Hebden Bridge residents launched a campaign against Sir Bernard Ingham to have him removed as a local newspaper columnist over his continued refusal to apologise for his words in the immediate aftermath of the Hillsborough disaster. It was Thatcher who, aided and abetted by the smear spread by local Conservative MP Irving Patnick, encouraged her press secretary Bernard Ingham to spread the campaign of lies and misinformation aimed at blaming the victims of a tragedy, exonerating the police who were, as the world now knows, the true guilty party. When Judge Peter Taylor reported a year later Thatcher even overruled her Home Secretary, Douglas Hurd, who wanted to accept the unwelcome truth. Although there can be no excusing what happened at Hazel, the stadium in the Belgian capital was antiquated and unfit for purpose. However, it was English, mostly Liverpool, fans who rioted, whose actions resulted in 39 deaths. Following the Heysel Stadium disaster and amid growing concerns regarding football hooliganism in the United Kingdom, records from the National Archives show that Downing Street and Margaret Thatcher attempted to launch an initiative to mark the return to decency in British soccer called Goalies Against Hoolies. Ingham said that Enough is enough, an entirely new attitude and approach by government, police, football clubs and players, and we hope the mass of decent fans governs the new season. We suspect that they wanted a powerful enough excuse to force through legislation to make all of the first division stadiums soon to become the Premier League all-seater stadiums, as well as the second division stadiums, which would be an extremely lucrative project for the firms converting the stadiums and others like Rupert Murdoch's Sky TV and Sports Betting and Alan Sugar manufacturing Sky satellite dishes. Many billions of pounds would be involved and who got the contracts? Follow the money. Bert Millichip, who in 1989 was chairman of the FA, worked with and for a company that supplied all of the plastic seats for the stadiums. He can be seen behind Maggie Thatcher in a photo taken on the day they visited Hillsborough. Who were the directors and joint beneficiaries of that? Ted Croker and Mike McGinnity were. The company was called Pell, but who else gained from the conversion? In summer 1989, 
with Judge Peter Taylor still conducting his inquiry, and the Football Association pushing hard for all seater stadium, McGinnity, a personal friend of FA Chairman Sir Bert Mullichip, bought a company, Pell, which made plastic seats. He then formed a specific division, Pell Stadium Seating, and took on as a director Ted Croker, the recently retired Secretary of the FA. Croker's son-in-law, Nick Harrison, was appointed sales director in January 1990, the month Taylor published his report. Nick Harrison is still sales director and estimates that Pell installs 150 to 200,000 seats a year, capturing between 40 and 60% of the market. Pell, based in Oldbury, West Midlands, won huge football trust contracts worth millions, installing 1.6 million plastic seats at £6 each in soccer grounds. The company turned over £75 million last year. Throughout, until his 1996 retirement as FA Chairman, Sir Bert Millichip was a trustee of the Football Trust, responsible for awarding grants, which funded many of the ground conversion projects. Sir Bert says he was a personal friend of McGinnity's and of Ted Croker's. In a programme on Radio 5 Live's On The Line, both McGinnity and Harrison say that McGinnity's football connections, and particularly those of Croker, were instrumental in enabling Pell to establish themselves as a major supplier of seats. Since 1990, Pell have installed an estimated 1.6 million seats, including at premiership clubs such as Manchester United and Liverpool. Currently, Pell is a major sponsor and only seating company represented in Football Nation, an international trade tour by the UK stadium industry, personally endorsed by Tony Blair. All of this has flowed from setting up in time to benefit from the Taylor Report. A principal recommendation of the Taylor Report was the move towards all seated stadia and the government duly passed legislation because of the Hillsborough disaster, requiring all clubs in the top two divisions to play matches before spectators in seated accommodation only. This heralded a massive building and development programme in the UK. The Taylor Report recommended that public money via £160 million grants from the Football Trust that Bert Millichick was a member of should help fund the compulsory seating of grounds, and it has led to the enrichment of many of the same people. Sheila Spears of the Football Supporters Association said, The people who set up this company took advantage of what was in the Taylor Report. The whole problem seems to be it was the fans who suffered and died. They haven't got any benefits out of Hillsborough at all, and so many other people have. And this is an example of the people in the heart of the football organisation and ruling bodies, also using Taylor's edict on all-seater to make large amounts of money. It's quite sickening. In his report, Judge Peter Taylor criticised the Football Association, both specifically for not considering Hillsborough's suitability as a cup semi-final venue, and more generally for failing to take responsibility for safety standards in football. His verdict on directors was damning. In some instances, it is legitimate to wonder whether the directors are genuinely interested in the welfare of their grassroots supporters. Boardroom struggles for power, wheelie dealing in the buying and selling of shares, and indeed of whole clubs, sometimes suggest that those involved are more interested in the personal financial benefits or social status of being a director. As a general rule of thumb, it is considered that installing seats on a standing terrace would probably reduce the spectator capacity by half and thus lose weekly revenue for the clubs, who would no doubt resist the idea for that reason. Hence the need for the Hillsborough disaster to be planned 
and carried out. You, you can't crush all those people if people were orderly. It's just not possible unless you know a way that I don't. Whenever there's a major incident, it's always the media that says stampede, panic, implication, crowd at fault. Reality is the crowd's rarely at fault. The crowd's reacting to the system that's been set up. So if, for instance, I have a design that will not cope with the capacity, it's not the crowd's fault. If it uh, fails to have the right signage when you're heading towards an event, or the ticket information is printed badly or it's misleading, that's not the crowd's fault. You say you're going to be there at 2.45 and they turn up at 2.30, well, they're doing the right thing. Clubs afterwards would have to consider how best to change their standing areas into seats without significant reduction of their stadium capacity. In most cases this could only be achieved by demolishing the old standing terraces and building new seats only stands. Some clubs decided to do this on their existing stadium site. Others opted to sell their existing stadium usually for housing development, and to build a new stadium elsewhere in the city. In the two decades since publication of the Taylor Report, more than 30 new stadia have been built in England, along with some 200 new grandstands, which have been built on existing stadium sites. But if football clubs were suffering financially from falling attendances, how could they afford to fund such an extensive programme of stadium development? In the first instance, the UK government lent a hand. In discussion with the football pools companies that Murdoch was involved in, the Thatcher government reduced the betting tax that it levied on the football pools. Monies accruing from this betting tax reduction were channelled into a special trust fund which clubs could draw on as priming funding for any stadium development. Then, in 1992, the Premier League was formed and a link-up with Sky TV led to a significant increase in broadcasting revenue for the major football clubs in England. But the redevelopment of Stadia provided other commercial opportunities. It gave clubs not only the chance to provide improved facilities for spectators, but also to incorporate additional restaurant and hospitality facilities and even conference facilities enabling the stadium to be used on more than just match days. Some clubs have also sold the naming rights of the stadium itself or of the individual stands. The Premier League has the highest revenue of any football league in the world, with total club revenues of £2.48 billion in 2009-10. stroke In 2013-14, Due to the improved television revenues and cost controls, the Premier League had net profits in excess of £78 million, exceeding all other football leagues. In 2010, the Premier League was awarded the Queen's Award for Enterprise in the international trade category for its outstanding contribution to international trade and the value it brings to English football and the United Kingdom's broadcasting industry. The Premier League includes some of the richest football clubs in the world. Deloitte's Football Money League listed seven Premier League clubs in the top 20 for the 2009-10 season, and all 20 clubs were in the top 40 globally by the end of the 2013-2014 season largely as a result of increased broadcasting revenue. From 2013, the league generates £2.2 billion per year in domestic and international television rights, all of which would be an enormous incentive to plan the disaster at Hillsborough, to force through the legislation to make the clubs build all-seater stadiums. Chapter 2 Rupert Murdoch's Involvement 
Murdoch is the man who earned a fortune making pornography mainstream on a daily basis with his son page three topless girls in order to corrupt the morals of the nation. He brought us phone hacking and he has killed journalism and replaced it with propaganda that benefits his business empire. Rupert Murdoch hoped to put Maggie Thatcher in power and keep her there, in a symbiotic relationship, as she helped him to grow his business empire. He has made a fortune out of acquiring newspapers with her help and televising the Premier League matches. From day one, his print media has supported the lies that were told about the supporters that day. Was he involved in the planning and thus the blaming of the fans so he could take over the televising of the matches? It certainly appears so. The new age of television offers untold opportunities for those equipped to grasp the future. What business was Dennis Thatcher in? Did the Thatchers have shares in the company or companies that got the contracts or get sweeteners from the contractors and or Murdoch? This needs investigating. In The Independent, Bruce Anderson noted one case where Dennis Thatcher had influenced policy. Football, in his view, was run by Bulgarian spivs in astrakhan coats and gold jewellery. So he helped to persuade his wife to regulate the misbehaviour of soccer crowds. There are various articles that prove the symbiotic relationship between Thatcher and Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch bet everything he had on satellite television when he launched his first satellite from French Guyana and was extremely nervous about it. He told Andrew Neil that if it failed he would lose everything. By the end of 1988 Sky had already cost Rupert Murdoch £120 million and the new satellite he needed hadn't even been launched. On the night the rocket went up. He kept on calling me to find out if the rocket had gone up. I told him that there was bad cloud, it was delayed. He called and I said, look Rupert, I have a hotline to French Guiana. The moment I know you know, could you just leave me alone? And he said, I will, I'm sorry for calling. He said, you know, I'm betting the company on this, Andrew. If this satellite doesn't go up, we're finished. <laughs> Watching the world news. Sky went on air on the 5th of February 1989. After the successful launching of the satellite and Sky going live on February the 5th 1989, his business was still not making money and he was desperate and desperate men do desperate things. Murdoch said that sport was a battering ram for pay TV and five weeks later the Hillsborough disaster happened, which led to the billions he made from broadcasting the Premier League. From Murdoch's own Sky News, how football changed after Hillsborough. The transformation of football in the last 27 years is remarkable but it might not have happened so swiftly, if at all, had it not been for the deadly events of 15th of April 1989 at Hillsborough. Inference 
about Rupert Murdoch. We believe that at a high level, in cahoots with Margaret Thatcher, some of her cabinet office, and key members of the Football League, Rupert Murdoch was an integral part of the initial plot to stage what they would claim was an accident at Hillsborough. Hillsborough's Leppings Lane was notoriously dangerous for crushing, and like Hazel, was unfit for purpose, and therefore a perfect candidate for carrying out the plan. Murdoch and his empire would be the ones to gain most financially in the long term, from ushering in an enhanced image of football as a result of enhanced stadiums, by securing lucrative long-term TV broadcasting and betting contracts. This he would secure in return for his initial support via his extensive media influence and his extensive involvement with the betting industry from where the initial funds for ground improvement derive. Probability assessment, 95%. 1. Murdoch's symbiotic relationship with Thatcher was plainly evident. 2. In 1989, Rupert Murdoch had links with Vernon's Pools in Australia. 2nd of May 1989, Rupert Murdoch, Kerry Packer and Vernon's and their company Australian Pools Limited end their association with the troubled Australian soccer pools. The initial funding for the all-seater stadiums came from a tax reduction on the football pool companies arranged by Maggie Thatcher. These were Littlewoods, Vernons and Zetters at the time. 3. In 1989, Ladbrokes acquired Vernons Pools. Years later, Rupert Murdoch's Sky entered into a £30 million joint venture with Ladbrokes. 4. Murdoch described sport as a battering ram for pay television, providing a strong customer base, and in 1992 the Premier League was formed, and a link-up with Rupert Murdoch's Sky TV led to a significant increase in broadcasting revenue for the major football clubs in England. 5. In the aftermath of the Hillsborough disaster, the phones of some of the bereaved families were undoubtedly tapped, but it was not investigated. This modus operandi was a proven tactic used by Rupert Murdoch's News of the World. Six, it was Rupert Murdoch's Sun newspaper, which immediately did the most to smear and damage the reputation of the Liverpool supporters and put the blame on them to divert attention away from the plotters. Outrageous, despicable lies were fed to the Sun newspaper by local Tory MP Irving Patney, who had strong links with Freemasonry in Sheffield. After the second inquest verdict, it was Rupert Murdoch's Times newspaper which did the least to set the record straight in its coverage after the jury verdict of unlawful killing. 7. According to Andy Burnham, after the Stuart Smith scrutiny, Tony Blair did not order a Hillsborough inquiry because he did not want to offend Rupert Murdoch. I've got to like him more and fear him less now that you know, there's nothing he can do to put me in power or not put me in power or whatever. How Murdoch grew sky in the aftermath of Hillsborough. In the autumn of 1991, talks were held for the broadcast rights for the Premier League for a five-year period from the 1992 season. ITV were the current rights holders and fought hard to retain the new rights. ITV had increased its offer from £18 million to £34 million per year to keep control of the rights. ITV offered £205 million for the television rights and later increased their offer to £262 million, but were outbid by Rupert Murdoch, who saw it as an opportunity to lure new customers to their loss-making satellite service Sky Television PLC, who had been advised by Tottenham Hotspur chairman Alan Sugar 
the owner of Amstrad, who supplied the satellite dishes to Murdoch's Sky TV. Sugar taught Rupert Murdoch everything he knows about the limitless possibilities of modern technology. He introduced the News Corporation chairman to the dark arts of computers in 1990, on an Amstrad, of course. Trevor East of ITV heard Sugar on the telephone speaking to Murdoch at the Royal Lancaster Hotel in London in May 1992, advising an increased bid for the television rights. Sugar is alleged to have told Murdoch to blow them out of the water. Sugar, at the time, was supplying Sky TV with satellite dishes and was the only chairperson of a Big Five club to vote in favour of Sky's bid. He would soon take over Tottenham Hotspur. B Sky B joined forces with the BBC to make a counter bid. The BBC was given the highlights of most of the matches, while B Sky B, paying £304 million for the Premier League rights, would give them a monopoly of all live matches, up to 60 per year from the 1992 season. A few weeks after the deal, ITV went to the High Court to get an injunction, as it believed their bid details had been leaked before the decision was taken. ITV also asked the Office of Fair Trading to investigate, since it believed Rupert Murdoch's media empire, via its newspapers, had influenced the deal. A few days later, neither action took effect. ITV believed B Sky B was telephoned and informed of its £262 million bid, and Premier League advised B Sky B to increase its counter bid. B Sky B retained the rights, paying £670 million for a 1997 to 2001 deal, but was challenged by On Digital for the rights from 2001 to 2004. Thus, B Sky B were forced to pay £1.1 billion, which gave them 66 live games a year. Following a lengthy legal battle with the European Commission, which deemed the exclusivity of the rights to be against the interests of competition and the consumer, B Sky B's monopoly came to an end from the 2007 to 2008 season. In May 2006, the Irish broadcaster Setanta Sports was awarded two of the six Premier League packages that the English FA offered to broadcasters. Sky picked up the remaining four for £1.3 billion. In February 2015, Sky bid £4.2 billion for a package of 120 Premier League games across the three seasons from 2016. This represented an increase of 70% on the previous contract and was said to be £1 billion more than the company had expected to pay. This has been followed by staff cuts and increased subscription prices, including 9% in Sky's family package. Rupert Murdoch's tabloid will face a trial in civil court over allegedly hacking Ian Cotton's phone. Mr Cotton, who worked for Liverpool Football Club for 15 years, also advised the Hillsborough families after the release of the landmark Hillsborough Independent Panel Report in 2012. Why would Murdoch do that, unless he was afraid of the families finding out the truth? Chapter 3. Irving Patnick, The Fixer The Late Irving Patnick Inference as part of the Tory government and the sole local far-right-wing conservative politician in the Sheffield Labour Party stronghold, Irving Patnick, with his connections with the senior police and the Freemasons in Sheffield, was an integral member of a close-knit government-controlled team whom we believe constructed a plot to stage-manage an accident at Hillsborough and then do whatever became necessary 
to cover it up. I think that drink was a, um, a factor in the tragedy that happened at Hillsborough. And indeed, uh, yesterday I asked the Home Secretary if uh, uh, Lord Justice Taylor, who's doing the inquiry, would uh, pay particular attention to that, and he said he would. A former senior police officer has spoken exclusively to Channel 4 News after a report he'd written detailing command failings at Hillsborough was covered up. Retired Chief Inspector Frank Brayford claims he was told to keep quiet in the wake of the disaster. This comes following a recent inquest ruling that the 96 who died were unlawfully killed until West Midlands Police Senior Detective suddenly appeared in his office. And he said, Mr. Rayford, you will not be allowed to give evidence at the Taylor Inquiry. And as he moved then, he stood with his back, back to the door and he's holding the, the, the door handle so nobody could come in. And he said, and this conversation never happened. So I won't be allowed to give evidence to the Taylor inquiry and this conversation never happened and he gone. He left. He left all straight out, gone. Chief Inspector Frank Brayford of South Yorkshire Police suspects that this went all the way up to Westminster. It doesn't just stop at South Yorkshire Police, does it? I, I, think, this, I think this went all, all the way up to Westminster. Patnick would be the vital cog in the wheel, who would be a local fixer from Sheffield and who would be vital to enable the early propaganda to cover up the stunt to take firm hold in the immediate aftermath of the stage managed accident in order to shape and define the nation's early thinking. In return, Patnick for his gross misdeeds would be protected and richly rewarded with a knighthood and OBE and a prestigious position as one of the government's whips. Probability assessment, 95%. 1. In the immediate aftermath of the Hillsborough disaster, Patnick played an instrumental role in spreading lies about the Hillsborough disaster and did untold damage to help skew and distort the nation's thinking about Hillsborough, even though he was not at the match. I was speaking to these officers. They were tired, they were devastated. They said that they had been trying to save lives, that uh, they'd been attacked by some of the fans, they'd been kicked and punched even when they were giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and people were urinating. Roman one. After the disaster, allegations emerged from unnamed sources, later established to be a police federation spokesman and the Sheffield Conservative MP Irving Patnick claiming that Liverpool supporters had deliberately arrived late, determined to force entry to the ground. Roman 2. Patnick was the one who raised alcohol as the cause of the Hillsborough disaster in Parliament on April 17, 1989. Roman 3. In the immediate aftermath of Hillsborough, Patnick proffered extreme solutions such as a breathalyzer system for football fans to reinforce his false conceptual model of cause in the public's mind. Such promoting of ill-conceived and radical measures would serve to further help demonize Liverpool supporters and working class football supporters in general. Roman 4. It was not until 2012 that it was established that Patnick was the main source that led to the subsequent press and media smearing tactics put out by Murdoch's The Sun newspaper and others. Roman 5. Calls from Labour MP Eric Heffers to question the truth of The Sun's Patnick fed allegations on the very day they first came out fell on deaf ears in Parliament for far too long, no evidence was ever demanded of Patnick to back up his disgusting, outlandish and what should have been obviously unbelievable allegations. Roman 6 The police officers who allegedly told Patnick these outrageous lies were never identified and exposed until the HIP report, when it would have been a very simple and essential matter 
to establish their identities and veracity much sooner. Instead, the Tory establishment happily allowed Patnick's risable rhetoric to shape the nation's thinking, and for far too long, Patnick's version of events has held sway and were accepted as unvarnished truth within the majority of the nation. Roman 7. On the evening of the disaster, Patnick met with senior officers like Duckenfield and other police officers such as Inspector Sykes and Midup of the Police Federation at the Niagara Club. Patnick's letter reveals Duckenfield had been known to him for some time when he was a lower ranking officer. Roman 8. Patnick initiated contact with the sports minister Colin Moynihan that first evening and was there to meet him, the sports minister, upon his arrival at Niagara, where police officers of all ranks had gathered. It is not clear whether or not Moynihan was hosted at Patnick's home that first evening. Roman 9. Patnick initiated contact with Chief Constable Deer of West Midlands Police immediately after it was decided West Midlands Police would be responsible for evidence gathering and exerting undue influence on the coroner Stefan Popper. 2. Patnick was also the chairman of trustees of the Trust for Research into Freemasonry a charity established to support the Centre for Research into Freemasonry and Fraternalism at the University of Sheffield. He was the Vice President of Sheffield's Kingfield Synagogue, Life President of Sheffield Jewish Representative Council and a former National Vice Chairman of the British Maccabi Sports and Youth Organisation. Most of Patnick's family were thought to be Freemasons, it is known that Patnick had known Freemason Duckenfield for a number of years. 3. Patnick was knighted in 1994, having spent only five years in a position as a Tory party assistant whip, promoted to that position on the 24th of July 1989, shortly after the Hillsborough disaster. 4. Patnick only issued an apology for being the source of the original smears after and not before the HIP report had found him out in 2012, a full 24 years after the event. 24 years would have been ample time for him to set the record straight given the blatant falsehood and the untold damage which he would have known he had caused given the damaging elements of his story had come directly from his lips in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. His actual apology was disingenuous. 5. In making his double injustice apologies in 2012, the then Tory Prime Minister Cameron was quick to condemn the initial lies of the police. However, absent was any mention of Patnick's highly significant role in that disgraceful development. Opposition clamours made for Patnick to be stripped of his knighthood were resisted by the government, and they even went so far as to disable a government petition which had been created by the public to that effect. 6. Patnick was in the building contract industry, having completed studies at Sheffield Polytechnic. Did he make money from the stadium conversions? 7. Patnick was an ideal fixer of the Conservative Party, having initially coined the expression of the People's Republic of South Yorkshire at the time of Orgreave and Margaret Thatcher's clash with the miners from South Yorkshire. Chapter 4 Making sense of it all. To make sense of what happened, in the House of Commons debate on the 17th of October 2011, Liverpool MP Steve Rotherham said that there was misprinting on the time on the tickets, and on the back of the tickets it said, Please take up your position 15 minutes before kickoff. That advice on the tickets 
and the police holding the supporters back from the ground created the rush and crush of the fans to get in before kickoff. And we suspect, with a reasonably large degree of certainty, that it was deliberate. The fact that there was already a long line of ambulances outside before the match had started, ready to deal with the injured that were planned to be created by the last minute rush and crush, would indicate that it was planned to have the necessary considerable number of casualties. Panorama 2013 How they buried the truth C.C. Peter Wright says the crush was caused by the late arrival of large numbers of people when it was the time printed on the tickets and South Yorkshire police who had caused that delay and late arrival by holding some of them back from getting to the ground until at least 2.45 instead of the supporters being already inside the stadium by 2.45. Question one, why did Liverpool fans arrive at Hillsborough late, causing the crush outside the ground? Coach operators and British Rail say they got the vast majority of Liverpool supporters to the vicinity of the stadium by two o'clock, an hour before kickoff. Yet eyewitnesses claim that at 2.30, although the forest end was packed, there were large spaces in the Leppings Lane end reserved for Liverpool fans with little prospect of filling the ground before kickoff time. Some alleged that around 430 supporters arriving at 5 to 2 on a special train at Wadsley Bridge Station, about three quarters of a mile from the ground, were not allowed by police to move off until around 2.30, increasing the chances of a last-minute surge on the turnstiles. There had been three special trains from Liverpool in 1988. This time, there was only one. It arrived early, just before 2 p.m. at Wadsley Bridge Station. The 350 passengers were met by both mounted and foot police officers who escorted them in a crocodile down Leppings Lane. But why was there only one train instead of three? Was it to cause congestion and delay at Hillsborough with more people having to use trains to the city centre instead of to Wadsley and others having to use road transportation and or their own cars then needing to find parking spaces, creating more congestion in the area. The late arrival of Liverpool fans. Taylor Report, Clause 191. Between 2.30pm and 2.40pm, the crowd waiting for the turnstiles swelled to over 5,000 and became unmanageable. The case made for the police was that large numbers of Liverpool supporters arrived late a high proportion of them were drunk and uncooperative. A high proportion had no tickets. All of them were hell-bent on getting in on time. They say this was unforeseeable and explains why they lost control. Clause 192. Whether those who arrived between 2.30pm and 2.40pm were late was much debated. The ticket simply requested its holder to take up his position 15 minutes before kickoff. That may have been intended to persuade those with stand tickets to take their seats, but it would not be unreasonable for a standing spectator to arrive at the turnstiles between 2.30 and 2.40 p.m., whether they were late or not. However, there was certainly a large concentration of Liverpool fans arriving at about 2.30 p.m. and after. One or two casualties would be insufficient to get the legislation passed due to the enormous expense and inconvenience involved in upgrading the stadiums. To refuse to pass the bill this session to deal with problems already identified and then to leave ourselves with no vehicle by which to respond immediately to the lessons from Hillsborough including an all-seating stadium, would be a very grave decision for this House. Before the 96 bodies were identified, or probably even called, Jimmy Hill and the BBC were already on side with and promoting the plan for all-seater stadiums on the BBC's Match of the Day, quickly followed by others 
including later on the official Taylor report. A final comment on this tragic day. We're a funny old nation. In the early 80s at Coventry City, we created an all-seater stadium right, where something like this couldn't have happened. And the local paper you know, campaigned with the public to say they wanted to stand up at football matches. I wondered whether those who were there today would want to stand up again in the future. The best thing we can do for the memory of those who've died today is to change the face of our soccer stadia in this country and build a monument to them that's decent and clean and where that kind of thing can't happen. Right, a disaster. So will the government's plan to make fans carry identity cards. Terraces will be torn up and all spectators will have to have seats. The government announced that they wanted to move towards all seat stadiums for major events in the future. He said the government would push ahead with its plans to introduce identity cards for all spectators. There could also be proposals to make all major football grounds seating only stadia. The government believes that the future of football in this country lies in a national membership scheme in designated grounds. And now it seems also, and now it seems also, and now it seems also in providing all seated accommodation at major football clubs. Now what about an all seating stadium? That might have helped, might it not, on Saturday? I'm in favour of an all-seating policy, but it'll take some time. It can't be done overnight, it can't be done for next season. It has to come in gradually. The government's call for all-seat stadia would mean the end of the terraces, where generations of fans have stood to watch soccer matches. And FIFA, the world governing body of soccer, says seating is likely to be compulsory at all major matches. But seats cost money. The present manager there, former Aberdeen boss Alex Ferguson, says making the ground there permanently seats only would be very expensive. Oh yeah, you're talking millions. How quickly big clubs will follow the example of Aberdeen and move to all-seat stadiums remains to be seen. Italy is preparing all-seat stadiums for next year's World Cup on the insistence of the international ruling body FIFA. By next year's cup final, these Wembley terraces will be seated, creating England's first all-seater stadium. The completion of the ID card bill in the Lords so will be delayed a bit, Mr Hurd said, investment. for reasons of seamliness. And he also hinted that it won't arrive in the Commons until the government has added on something about all-seater stadiums. There is a move, and I think it's a healthy move, towards solving several of these problems by going uh, all-seat. Who is going to pay for all-seated accommodation? Do you expect the clubs to, or will the government do it? And if it is the clubs, what sort of time scale? How long are you going to give them to do that? Well, that is what we need to consult them about, and that is why there will be a pause now in, uh, in uh, discussion of the Football Spectators Bill. Uh, obviously, money does come into this. Uh, obviously, they have money. Uh, obviously, it's partly a matter of uh, priorities. But we do believe, and I'm glad that uh, Graham Kelly, the chief executive of the FA, said this, uh, I think, on the BBC the other day. We do believe the time has come to move as rapidly as possible towards, uh, for the big games, all seated matches. If they can't have these matches without all this upset, both to the people who are attending it and those who've got the job of trying to sort it all out, then it shouldn't take place. Let them watch it on television or something like that. In 1999, Hill moved from the BBC to Murdoch's Sky Sports, where he featured on Jimmy Hill's Sunday Supplement, a weekly discussion show between Hill and three football journalists conducted over a Sunday breakfast. McGinnity was a top club official at Coventry, where Jimmy Hill, OBE, BBC Match of the Day commentator, had previously been a manager and director which helps explain why Jimmy Hill plugged the all-seater stadiums on the day of the disaster. McGinnity was rewarded with an MBE. Coventry installed all-seater stadium seats as early as 1981, but Leeds United fans ripped them out soon afterwards, so the idea did not take off immediately. Ironically, it was a Leeds versus Coventry semi-final in 1987 played at Leppings Lane, which brought Leppings Lane safety again into focus. In 1989, the attendant in the last of the only three emergency vehicles that drove onto the pitch was Tony Edwards. 
according to an article by Graham MacGyver and the BBC. Only one more ambulance drove onto the pitch. The ambulance man on board this third vehicle says the emergency response was chaotic. I always think in terms of a rail accident. Could you imagine the public outcry if all ambulance crews remained on an embankment simply because they couldn't get the ambulance down to the scene of the, of the accident? That doesn't happen. They get out of their vehicles, and if that's the length of a football pitch that they have to go, then they make their way there. In a later interview, Tony Edwards said, We weren't doing any good. You were used to having one casualty in the back but there were too many bodies to deal with. We just didn't do a very good job that day. We left people on that pitch who were being worked on and there were no professionals there to help them. There were 44 ambulances waiting outside the stadium and that means 80 odd staff could have been inside the ground but they weren't allowed in. There was no fighting. The survivors were deciding who was the priority, who we should deal with. The police weren't. We weren't. Can you imagine a rail accident where all the ambulances wait on the embankment while the survivors bring the casualties up? I took away the wrong people. Just yards from the centre of the tragedy, senior police officers from the South Yorkshire Police sat in the control room of Hillsborough monitoring CCTV cameras and watched, seemingly frozen, as carnage unfolded in front of them because of Assistant Chief Constable Walter Jackson whimpering under the table. The inaction of senior officers was in direct contrast to the frantic efforts of ordinary Liverpool supporters and their attempts to save lives. Andy Hymas told Tony Farrell that, before entering the ground, he noticed that there were a large number of ambulances parked outside. How many casualties were they counting on creating? Tony Edwards said there were 44 ambulances parked outside. Colin Moynihan, the Minister of Sport, was informed by Superintendent B. Mason in a letter dated 13th of April 1988, immediately after the previous identical semi-final held on the 9th of April 1988 about the crush in the Leppings Lane stand and how dangerous it had been, but his warning was ignored with fatal consequences the following year. Was that criminal negligence on Moynihan's part or deliberate? The evidence given to the inquest by former Inspector Harry White is further indication that the crush was planned and that the police stood back and let it happen. The importance of gate management was already well known. Police took steps to prevent overcrowding at the Leppings Lane end at a match three months before the Hillsborough disaster. The Hillsborough inquests heard that police stopped fans going into the central pens on Leppings Lane when they became too full at a league match between Liverpool and Sheffield Wednesday three months before the disaster. Andrew Watson who attended both games, gave evidence of his experiences. He told counsel to the inquest, Christina Lambert, that after going through turnstiles at the league match in January 1989, he ideally would have wanted to go behind the goal. But when he neared the tunnel to the central pens, one gate was completely closed and the other partially shut. The planners appear to have even made a practice run on the 31st of January 1989 at Barnsley Football Ground, where the police opened an exit gate and let people stream into the ground, possibly to test their plan for Hillsborough less than three months later. It was reported in the Sheffield Star newspaper on Tuesday, April 18, 1989, that 
Police had the gate opened at Oakwell, Barnsley. The decision made by a senior South Yorkshire police officer was taken without consultation with Barnsley Football Club officials, who have since complained. Barnsley Football Club secretary Michael Spinks said 22 busloads of Stoke City fans arrived outside Oakwell for an FA Cup replay five minutes before kickoff on January the 31st. Mr Spinks believes they had been held up by police on the outskirts of Barnsley for some time, just like they are alleged to have done with Liverpool supporters at Hillsborough on April the 15th. He went on, they arrived outside, possibly with a police escort. They made their way to the turnstiles in an exuberant manner and, after queuing for some time, the senior police officer on duty took the view that they be allowed straight in. Coroner Goldring at the inquest said that PC Michael Ryan agreed that exit gates being opened was unprecedented. This is obviously not true because it was done in Barnsley by South Yorkshire Police a few weeks earlier. Chapter 5. Controlling the Media Coverage Was it normal for Andy Hymas, the South Yorkshire Police Press Officer, to be at Hillsborough to report on the semi-final? Or was he there to make sure the planned disaster media coverage got stage managed through his press releases? His refusal to blow the whistle on Jackson is very suspicious. He retired from South Yorkshire Police in 2011. From Andy Hymas' statement to the inquest, I, Andy Hymas, went to Hillsborough Football Ground in company with Chief Superintendent Duckenfield. I entered the ground with Chief Superintendent Duckenfield by an entrance used by the police. During the early part of the day, I was dealing with Mr Tony Donnelly, crime reporter from the Nottingham Evening Post. This was to organise an interview with the Divisional Commander, Chief Superintendent Duckenfield. Why would the interview be with a crime reporter at a football match, rather than a sports reporter? This would be an unnecessary distraction from focusing on the managing of the match by an inexperienced officer Duckenfield. that Hayley Court, a newcomer from the same South Yorkshire Police Department, was told to manage, spin and control the media coverage of the inquest. Guardian interview. From her first day in the job, 19th of May 2014, Court said she was expected to be a spin doctor for the force at the inquests at the court in Warrington. Court said she was told your job is to round up the media at the end of the day and tell them, this is the line. Was that also Andy Hymas' reason for being sent there? Chapter 6. The Perfect Planning Opportunity Prime Minister Maggie Thatcher's hatred of Liverpoolians would make the semi-final involving Liverpool Football Club a perfect opportunity to punish the Liverpool supporters for Heysel, as she would see it, and get the legislation through, whilst blaming her hated Liverpool supporters for the disaster because of the supporters' bad reputation after Heysel in 1985. They would have counted on the fact that most people outside of Liverpool would have thought that the Liverpool supporters got what they deserved for what they did at Heysel in 1985 and the planners knew that would allow the government to get away with their story of blaming the supporters. Their evil plan succeeded for 27 years. Who decided to allocate the Leppings Lane end to the Liverpool supporters rather than to Knox Forest? 
where there was a dangerous crush the year before when the same teams played there in the previous semi-final. The FA, the Football Association, wanted Liverpool fans to be given the larger end of the Hillsborough Stadium for the 1989 semi-final. The inquest into the disaster heard evidence from Chief Superintendent Brian Morrow, now deceased, who was responsible for policing the 1987 and 1988 FA Cup finals at the stadium. The jury listened to extracts from an interview by Judge Peter Taylor, who led the initial inquiry into the disaster, in which Chief Superintendent Moll talked about the FA Football Association requesting more facilities for Liverpool fans at the 1989 match. But Chief Superintendent Moll, who, working under Assistant Chief Constable Walter Jackson, led planning for the 1989 semi-final, said he wanted the same arrangement as there was for the 1988 semi-final, with the Liverpool fans taking the smaller capacity Leppings Lane end and Nottingham Forest fans the larger capacity end. In the interview with Judge Peter Taylor, Chief Superintendent Moll agreed he had made it crystal clear to the Football Association that the only way his force would agree to police the game was if the arrangements were the same as the 1988 semi-final. The jury heard that Liverpool Football Club had also asked the Football Association for a bigger allocation of tickets for the 1989 match, but Chief Superintendent Mole said this was not possible because of which end the club had been allocated. After making certain that Liverpool fans would use the Leppings Lane end, he was then conveniently removed at the last minute and Duckenfield put in his place. Was Mole in on the plan and used to set things up, but then replaced with a patsy so that Mole would not get blamed? Having vast experience, including the previous semi-final, he could not get away with allowing what happened because he knew how to prevent it. It would have made the plan obvious and everyone would smell a rat so they needed an inexperienced patsy. John Motson, sports commentator of the BBC on the day, said, Yeah, yeah, I've got an explanation for what's happened here, Peter. I'm going to give you a line. And the story emerges that one of the outside gates leading into that terrace was broken. People without tickets got in were therefore overcrowding the people with tickets and that's why the crush occurred. Give you a line sounds very similar to this is the line that Haley Court was told to use by South Yorkshire Police with the media at the inquest. It's perhaps a clue to who told John Motson the line he used about the gate being broken by Liverpool fans. This snippet of commentary about broken gates was discredited within hours, but is still a very familiar explanation for what caused the crush in the central pens. However, the interesting thing about it is that, according to the graphic that appears on the screen, the time that Watson said it was 3.13pm. The notorious established story has it that the lie about a broken gate began when it was spun by Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield of the South Yorkshire Police to Graham Kelly and Glenn Kern of the Football Association. This was supposed to have happened when they confronted him in the police control box, even as the tragedy was playing itself out on the terraces below. This is even iterated in very damning terms in the Taylor Interim Report. The problem is that all sources detailing that confrontation between Duckenfield and the Football Association officials, including the Football Association officials themselves, agree that he told them the lie at 3.15pm. Therefore, Motson's commentary, unwittingly propagating the myth of ticketless fans taking advantage of a broken exit gate, was given voice some two minutes 
before Duck and Field so infamously peddled the same lie. Like the BBC announcing the fall of World Trade Center Building 7 on 9-11-2001, stating that it had fallen 25 minutes before it did, proving their foreknowledge of the plans. World Trade Center Building 7, like World Trade Center Buildings 1 and 2, was brought down by controlled demolition. However, this in no way exonerates Duckenfield, who was still knowingly spreading lies to shift blame for his mishandling of the crowd onto the victims, but it does raise a rather chilling question as to whether or not he really was the one who invented the broken exit gate red herring. It is now shown to be possible that somebody else invented the idea and that he just went along with it. Therefore, we now need to know who exactly passed this false information to John Motson at such an early stage. Did somebody in the South Yorkshire Police, other than Duck and Field, spin this lie, or someone in the BBC or government? If so, who was it? The Independent Police Complaints Commission needs to investigate and find out. It would constitute evidence that the blame shifting was not just being improvised by an individual officer in a moment of panic, but was actually orchestrated, even conspiratorial, at an even earlier stage than was previously demonstrated by the report of the Hillsborough Independent Panel. And above all, whoever did it needs to answer for it. Was it Assistant Chief Constable Walter Jackson? Edit 26-5-2013 According to the Taylor Interim Report, Assistant Chief Constable Walter Jackson entered the control box to find out what was going on around the time the players were taken off the field. He might have known something about this, and was high enough in authority to orchestrate a blame shift story in a moment of panic. We know from the inquest that both Mole and Duckenfield were Freemasons. This plot would need to be carried out by such a secret society, the members of which are sworn to secrecy and are used to keeping secrets to their grave. There is even some internet speculation that Hillsborough was also used as a Masonic sacrifice to their god Lucifer, Satan. The football stadium's home team is known as the Owls, and the Owl is a symbol used by the Illuminati and Freemasons, as it hides in darkness and avoids the light. The Owl also came to symbolize Satan, Lucifer, the Prince of Darkness. To medieval men, the Owl also represented the Jews who have rejected Jesus Christ. Thus, Olerton Football Stadium at Hillsborough would be the perfect location for an Illuminati Freemasonic sacrifice to Lucifer, Satan, on the anniversary of a very significant sacrifice day. Abraham Lincoln assassinated 15th of April 1865. The deliberate ramming into an iceberg at high speed and sinking of the Titanic, April 15, 1912. The Boston Marathon false flag bombing hoax, April 15, 2013. The Illuminati, which is the highest level of Freemasonry, to which Maggie Thatcher probably belonged, and Murdoch probably still does, used the owl as a symbol, because it sees in the dark, like the Illuminati metaphorically claim to do, because they are illuminated. Maggie Thatcher also wanted the police's role in it covered up.
It doesn't just stop at South Yorkshire Police, does it? I, I, think, this, I think this went all, all the way up to Westminster. Judging by the then PM's handwritten comments on this memo, sent to her on the eve of publication of Judge Peter Taylor's interim report into the disaster at the 1989 FA Cup semi-final, Mrs Thatcher retained a blind faith in the force, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Typed on August 2nd, 1989 by Caroline Slocop, Mrs Thatcher's private secretary, it forewarned the then Prime Minister about the strength of the criticisms being made against the police. However, it is Mrs Thatcher's personal asides which are most revealing about her attitude. What do you mean by welcoming the broad thrust of the report, she wrote. The broad thrust is devastating criticism of the police. Is that for us to welcome? The circular does the same. Surely we welcome the thoroughness of the report and its recommendations. These notes written in founding pen were signed M.T. Margaret Thatcher. She would defend South Yorkshire police because they helped her to break the miners in the Battle of Orgreave in 1984 and lie about it. The country's gravest miscarriage of justice. Many now concur that the families and friends of these football fans Men, women, boys and girls, crushed to death because of police operational failures, could have been spared 27 years of heartache and anguish if the dogmatic Thatcher government had not insisted that inebriated supporters were to blame. In Home Secretary Douglas Hurd's own confidential note to Mrs Thatcher on August 2, 1989, he said, Taylor concluded that the main reason for the disaster was the failure of police control. He could not have been clearer, he added. The actions of individual senior officers, especially Chief Superintendent Duckenfield, are criticised. References made to poor operational orders, lack of leadership and evidence of senior officers given to the inquiry is described as defensive and evasive. It would be for the Chief Constable and perhaps the Director of Public Prosecutions and the Police Complaints Authority to act on the conduct of individual officers. Why did Mrs Thatcher not listen? And why did Mr Hurd not resign on principle when told to soften his stance? Just think of the heartache that it would have saved. The fact that they promoted Norman Bettison to the rank of Chief Constable and sent him from Sheffield where he was involved in the criminal police aftermath of Hillsborough to Merseyside to watch and keep a lid on the Hillsborough families and survivors in Liverpool is very suspicious and this would again indicate government complicity. Bettison seems to have become their bent go-to cop for controlling situations for the government because they also sent him to be Chief Constable of West Yorkshire after the government orchestrated London bombings of 7-7-2005 where three of the Muslim patsies were from. Bettison was also given a knighthood for his services to the Crown by Elizabeth like many other villains involved in Hillsborough and other crimes that she has also similarly rewarded. Chapter 7. The Protection of ACC Walter Jackson. The Weak Link. We suspect that Assistant Chief Constable Walter Jackson was in on the plan to arrange a crush, but expected only a few casualties, with perhaps a few broken bones and perhaps one or two deaths. But when he saw the reality, enormity and extent of what was happening, he lost it and became a gibbering idiot whimpering under the table in the police control box. As told to Tony Farrell, South Yorkshire Police's former principal intelligence analyst, by Andy Hymas, who was there and saw Jackson whimpering under the table. 
being the highest ranking officer on the day in that condition hindered the other officers from doing what needed to be done because Assistant Chief Constable Jackson was there and he outranked them. He was their boss. The others would have been caught frozen like deer in the headlights, not knowing what to do. This is confirmed by PC Trevor Bichard to Coroner Goldring at the inquest, where he said he also agreed that it was a fair comment that it was indicative of a paralysis in decision-making that affected senior officers. At the inquiry, Judge Peter Taylor concluded that Duck and Field's capacity to take decisions and give orders seemed to collapse. Several vital minutes were wasted because Duck and Field froze. The vastly experienced match commander, Chief Superintendent Brian Mole, had been replaced a few days before the match with the recently promoted, totally inexperienced Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield who has since become the scapegoat, when he should not have been given the job by ACC Walter Jackson in the first place due to his lack of experience in policing football matches, especially not for such a high-profile match as the semi-final. Duck and Field did not feel up to the task due to lack of experience, but Jackson persuaded Duck and Field to accept the job. Did Jackson purposely set Duckenfield up to be the patsy and take the blame? David Duckenfield has even admitted to the inquest that he probably wasn't the best man for the job. I probably wasn't the best man for the job on the day, says Hillsborough Police Chief David Duckenfield, in giving evidence at the new inquests into the death of 96 Liverpool fans at Hillsborough. The fact that Jackson replaced Chief Superintendent Brian Moe, who had vast experience, including of the crush at the Leppings Lane end the previous year, and would have handled things very differently and could have prevented the disaster, with the totally inexperienced Duckenfield, means the deaths of the 96 are on Jackson's head, not Duckenfield's. Former Chief Constable Meredith Hughes told David Conn of The Guardian that the disaster resulted from a lack of command. That means Assistant Chief Constable Jackson was to blame because he was in overall command of Hillsborough. Identified in the uh, Taylor Report as a lack of command and a lack of leadership. Walter Jackson has recently stated that, in hindsight, he should have declared it a catastrophe which is their code word, so that it would be treated as such, and given the correct major incident response, which could at least have saved the 41 who were considered savable. However, we know that he did not declare anything or give any instructions because he was a gibbering idiot, whimpering under the control room table. Therefore, the deaths of those 41 are most definitely on Jackson's head. If he had not been there, the others could have made their own decisions and dealt with the situation, instead of just standing there protecting Jackson rather than helping the supporters. Why would Jackson be the only one in the control box in that condition unless he knew of the evil plan and was part of it? The fact that Everyone has covered up the truth about Jackson for 27 years and they are still doing so is very suspicious and indicates that he knows something that the authorities do not want revealed. They know from Hillsborough that he cracks under pressure and so have made certain he has never been put under any pressure, including by the inquest. This indicates that Coroner Goldring was in on it as well because he stated that Jackson was only to be asked short questions and not to be asked any questions of an adversarial nature, but must be treated with kid gloves. Why else would everyone be protecting him 
including Andy Hymas and all of the officers who were in the control box when he was under the table or were told about it by those that were in the control box. They have all lied under oath and thus committed perjury, which is a serious offence carrying a prison sentence, like Jonathan Aitken MP and Geoffrey Archer MP were given, and perverting the course of justice, which carries a life sentence of 20 years. Why would they risk that punishment unless they knew that they would be protected by the establishment, up to and including by Prime Minister Thatcher? Maggie Thatcher had a special relationship with South Yorkshire Police because they had helped her to destroy the miners at Orgreave and get away with lying about it. Not one scrap of evidence, not one piece of video or photographic evidence has been produced in this inquest that backs up the police case. Jackson, in his very senior position, would also certainly be involved in the cover-up, blaming the fans and falsifying statements, etc., as well as covering up his own misconduct on the day. Previously, he had also been given the job of reviewing the police evidence against the 95 miners arrested at the Battle of Orgreave, whose prosecutions were thrown out, and he did a whitewash cover-up, deciding that the police did nothing wrong. It can now be reported, because it was referred to in the Hillsborough Inquest's legal arguments, that the Orgreave internal review was written by Walter Jackson. He was a senior officer in 1984-86. Then, in 1989, he was the South Yorkshire Police Assistant Chief Constable for Operations. Jackson is one of the former senior officers currently subject to IPCC investigation into Hillsborough for his role on the day and the force's response afterwards. Jackson's internal Orgreave review was sent to Peter Hayes the then Deputy Chief Constable, the officer closest to Wright. Hayes gave evidence at the Hillsborough inquests that after the disaster, Wright made him responsible for the force's legal response and evidence gathering. The conduct of that legal response to Hillsborough, in which the force ferociously blamed survivors of the lethal crush, is now the subject of the IPCC's biggest ever investigation into possible police perjury, perverting the course of justice and misconduct in a public office. Jackson's 1986 review of the Battle of Orgreave did not accept there had been perjury or malpractice and supported Wright's initial claim that the flaws in the police case were due to the chaotic events of the day. Wright being Peter Wright, Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police. Involved in both the Battle of Orgreave and the Hillsborough disaster cover-ups were Chief Constable Peter Wright, Deputy Chief Constable Peter Hayes, Assistant Chief Constable Walter Jackson, South Yorkshire Police Solicitor Peter Metcalf, and other officers of lesser rank. Jackson, whose huge portrait was on the wall in South Yorkshire Police headquarters at least up until 1993, as a hero and person to be revered and emulated, will have been in a perfect position to influence subsequent chief constables and assistant chief constables to maintain the lies and cover-up, all the way from Richard Wells down to Chief Constable David Crompton. Let's hope their successor is cut from different cloth, not a Freemason and made of different metal and sterner stuff. In a letter dated 8th of August 1997, reference ACC-ID-NMH, Ian Danes said Inspector Clive Calvert was naive for telling the Chief Constable Richard Wells that police witnesses had been coached and statements had been altered. Would Inspector Calvert's widow, Mrs Glennis Calvert, like to know who wrote that deceitful letter if she doesn't already know? Even Judge Stuart Smith covered it up, 
when he said there was no evidence of a cover-up after having been given such evidence by Officer Frost. Then there's the failed private prosecutions of Duckenfield and Murray under Sir Anthony Hooper. Also in 2011, Judge Popplewell of the Bradford Football Stadium disaster in 1985 made critical comments. XPC David Frost told Judge Stuart Smith that on the 19th of April 1989 we were taken to the pub by a senior officer, Chief Superintendent John Nesbitt, who basically said, It's backs to the wall, boys. We've all got to say the same thing. We were taken out for a drink by this senior officer, Chief Superintendent John Nesbitt, and we were basically told, Look, unless we all get our heads together and straighten it out, there are heads going to roll. We've all got to say the same thing, or as ACC Andy Holt and District Commander in Rotherham, Chief Superintendent, now as Acting Assistant Chief Constable Jason Harwin, would express it, enabling the one truth. Judge Stuart Smith lied when he assured Mr Frost that his claims were something which I am looking into. Mr Frost said he finally felt exonerated by the HIP panel's report after being rejected by Judge Stuart Smith. The judge has refused to comment since the report was published. Chapter 8. Conclusion Nothing else except that it was planned makes any sense, including as to why Jackson was whimpering under the table. And they have all, including two coroners, the disreputable West Midlands Police, Judge Stuart Smith, Tony Blair, Jack Straw, both Conservative and Labour governments, Meredith Hughes, Chief Constable David Crompton and others covered up and protected Jackson to this day. This all-encompassing 27 years and still ongoing cover-up cannot be merely to protect one cop's negligence or incompetence. It has to be much, much bigger than that. To include successive governments and major figures in the police, judiciary and business spheres. They knew not only from the previous year that there were safety issues with Hillsborough and specifically the Leppings Lane end, but also from as far back as 1981, when 38 people from Alan Sugar's Tottenham Hotspur were crushed and injured in the Leppings Lane stand. There were broken arms, legs and ribs, and 38 people were treated either in hospital or by the St John Ambulance Brigade. Paul Jackson, who worked for Sheffield City Council's Environmental Protection Unit, claims he had been made aware of concerns over the crush barriers, their height and spacings, a year before the tragedy which killed 96 Liverpool fans. Paul revealed that he raised concerns about the safety of Hillsborough Stadium 12 months before the disaster, but was told by his superiors to keep his nose out. Inspector Clive Calvert told Chief Constable Richard Wells that this semi-final should not have been held in Sheffield for a second successive year. Why not Old Trafford? It would have made much more sense to have been held at Old Trafford which was more central and a far better stadium. They knew Hillsborough's Leppings Lane end was a death trap and a disaster waiting to happen, and it was entirely predictable that, given the right circumstances, this disaster would happen. It appears to have been purposefully made to happen, and that those circumstances were manufactured for enormous financial profits. And I think that the issue is that it was always on the cards. It was entirely predictable. It was entirely foreseeable. Maggie Thatcher already had a close relationship with South Yorkshire Police because of Orgreave, 
would have known she could rely on South Yorkshire police to go along with the evil plan and cover up who was behind it. Greater Manchester Police would have been an unknown quantity and Old Trafford a safe stadium, so this would make it imperative that Sheffield was selected. Mr Speaker, the last question is for us in this House. What kind of country leaves people who did no more than wave off their loved ones to a football match, still sitting in a courtroom 27 years later, begging for the reputations of their sons, daughters, brothers, sisters and fathers? The answer is one that needs now to do some deep soul searching. This cover-up went right to the top. It was advanced in the committee rooms of this House and in the press rooms of 10 Downing Street. It persisted because of collusion between elites in politics on both sides, police and the media. Home Secretary Amber Rudd, who is a member of the late Maggie Thatcher's beloved Conservative Party, has refused to allow an independent inquiry into the Battle of Orgreave. No surprise there. The cover-ups continue unabated. That is the reason for this film, designed to force former Assistant Chief Constable Jackson and the officers who did the cover-up to break ranks and spill the beans, so that we can get to the top and bottom of what happened and real justice for the 96, the injured and their families. My Lords and Members of the House of Commons, my government will use the opportunity of a strengthening economy to deliver security for working people, to increase life chances for the most disadvantaged. This includes all of the people involved going to prison and not just scapegoats, as Stephen Kelly rightly stated at the press conference after the verdict of unlawful killing was announced. Steve Kelly would like to say something. Hey, sorry, if we could just wind back a little bit, the gentleman from the Daily Mirror. Yeah, uh, you'd asked about uh, Mr Duckerfield. While I fully endorse what Steve said, uh, we need to be very, very careful about how we answer these kind of questions. But I think what the wider press needs to realise is that there's more than Mr Duckenfield needs to be looked at here yeah, yeah. in the, the events that, that we've heard today. The, the ambulance service, the police force itself, and then whatever avenues we, know, we need, need to go down, we certainly need to widen our search to find out who was guilty of any offences that day. And if appropriate, they should all answer to the courts. And let's hope that's so. Amen to that. Long live the fighters. More deep.